So, thank you very much. Thank you to Professor Cato for the invitation to come here. It's always a great delight to be in Kyoto, especially in this room. I, I like to be in this room, so it's nice to be back. I want to talk about, uh, I hope it will be an, a, a gentle talk, an, an easy talk, nothing too s stressful. I, I just want to uh, introduce, make an introduction to, well, uh, just a piece, part of the work of uh, Kohn, Alain Kohn, on what's called non-commutative geometry. Which uh, is a subject which is, I suppose, almost 20, uh, 40 years old. And so I just want to talk uh, about uh, a little piece of this. And it mostly has to do with uh, partial differential operators. I mean, not the whole subject, but the part that I'm going to discuss has to do with uh, partial differential operators from the point of view from the point of view of Hilbert space and operators on Hilbert space, uh, and especially algebras of operators on Hilbert space. In other words, operator algebras. I should say at the beginning that this subject would not exist without uh, the influence and the, and the work of Gennady Kasparov. And uh, although my lecture and his are, uh, will be on slightly different subjects, uh, perhaps you can think of, of my lecture as an introduction to, to uh, Professor Kasparov's lecture in the afternoon. Uh, certainly everyone in, in operator algebras was very much influenced by by Professor Kasparov, and, and what I'm going to discuss uh, reflects that. Okay. And uh, as I promised in the title, I, I want to talk, at least at the beginning, about uh, integral operators. So there will be some uh, background uh, material, several different topics. In, in, in background material, maybe we we'll call this uh, number one. So I, I want to discuss integral operators, the famous theorem of Hilbert that you all learn. You learn Hilbert's theorem in functional analysis class. And it has to do with operators uh, like this. There will be some space, some geometric space throughout the, the lecture. and. It, it will be, for simplicity, a smooth and compact manifold, some, some decent uh, space. I mean, it, at various points, it could be much more general, but let's assume um, it's something like this. Anyway, the operators we're interested in are integral operators, like that. And the subject, the theory of these operators depends very much on the behavior of K. And at the beginning, uh, people investigated uh, continuous functions. And a little later, it was decided that it would be OK if the function was just a square integrable function uh, like this. And uh, a little later still, um, still in the time of, of Hilbert, uh, a further generalization was found to be the best. Uh, so there's a way of characterizing uh, this type of operator plus a, a few more, uh, and that's the condition of compactness. So what I'm really going to talk about has to do with so-called compact operators on Hilbert space. But these are the main, the main examples. And uh, so these were analyzed first by Hilbert. And the, what, he, what he observed right away is, is that if you have two such operators, T1 and, and T2, uh, and if you compose them, then uh, 
the, the kernel is, is uh, this function k associated to t is easily obtained from the functions associated to t1 and t2 by a sort of convolution like this. Maybe I'll call this uh, z. I'm sorry. It looks nicer. And, and, and so by definition, this is such an expression as this. And, and what Hilbert observed uh, at the very beginning is, is that this formula resembles matrix multiplication. In matrix multiplication, you take the ijth entry of a matrix and you multiply against the jk element of a matrix, and then you add up over all j's and, and, and you get the ij my case element of, of, of the product like that. So Hilbert was inspired by, by in this case, algebras of uh, matrices to prove the following theorem. So this is the famous theorem of Hilbert, which tells you how these operators uh, behave in, in the case when T is uh, self-adjoint like this. So in, in the language of, of these kernels, self-adjoint means that the adjoint kernel is equal to k itself, and, and k star of x, y is just k of y, x bar. Like you see in matrices, the i, j entry of, of the adjoint of a matrix is the complex conjugate of the j, i entry. Anyway, if you have a matrix uh, like this, then There's some orthonormal basis, ortho, of the Hilbert space, consisting of eigenvectors, just like there is in matrices, eigenvectors or eigenfunctions. Like that. And and the eigenvalues for what for what it's worth, the eigenvalues uh, form a sequence uh, converging to zero like this. This is the famous theorem uh, of Hilbert. And uh, the, the, these compact operators that I'm talking about here are precisely in the self-adjoint world precisely the operators which for which the conclusion is true. And so we'll talk about self-adjoint operators as well as. Uh, integral operators. So this is a famous result from more than 100 years ago, an ancient result with many uh, beautiful applications to Dirichlet problem, to compact groups, to, to many other things. And uh, the basic aim is to add some uh, geometry or maybe differential topology to this story. And then we'll see what we get. And this is uh, what, what Kahn uh, succeeded in doing and, and what I want to uh, tell you about. Okay, good. So, Let me change, change our topics for a moment and, and give some different background. I suppose uh, D is some sort of linear partial differential operator on the manifold M. For example, some type of Cauchy-Riemann operator, maybe a Laplace operator, something, something like that. When you study uh, when you study linear differential operators, the first invariant of the operator, which tells you the most about the operator, uh, is the so-called principal symbol, which is a function, which is a function. You take the operator and you make it into a function. So if D is 
maybe some expression like this. Maybe the operator has order uh, Q. Maybe in local co coordinates, we could write the operator uh, in this way. Then this uh, principal symbol here, the sigma, is a function of two sets of variables. So one set of variables is the, are just the points uh, on M. And, and then, at least uh, locally, these size are just vectors like this. So of course, such an expression de depends on choosing some local uh, coordinates like this. And, and then what you're supposed to do to define the principal symbol is you're supposed to forget about all of the terms of lower order, keep only the terms of top order, and then keep the coefficients. And get rid of the derivatives and replace each derivative, each uh, ddx, you replace it by some uh, linear function, xi, of the new variable xi. So d to the alpha, for example, ddx1, ddx2, gets replaced by xi1 times xi2, like this. Just for small technical reasons, it's best to multiply by the square root of minus 1, no big deal. And uh, so that's the principal symbol. So this is some local recipe to construct a function uh, from an operator As it stands, it depends on a choice of coordinates, but uh, as you probably already know, there's an invariant way of understanding what this is, and it's uh, as a function on the cotangent uh, vector bundle. This function, and this is the reason for the square root of minus one, this function will be real valued, not all the time, but if, if d is, as they say, formally self-adjoint, which means for uh, L2 inner products, one has some formula like this. Oopsie. So the first thing to say about this uh, function is that it, there's some uh, invariant way of thinking about it. It's a function on, on something a little geometrical on, on the cotangent vector bundle. Incidentally, it's not going to be so important, but uh, you can check that this thing is, is invariantly defined on the cotangent bundle just by giving a formula for it, which is something like this. The first thing you do is you take d, you take a function on the manifold, and you look at the commutator of d with f. That is, uh, you look at the commutator of operators. f means the operator of multiplication by f, and d means d, and so you can form df minus fd. It's an operator. And OK, it's some new operator. If d has order q, this thing has order q minus 1. But you can do it again. Now it has order q minus 2. And you can just keep doing it q times. And after you've done it q times, the thing on the right-hand side is a differential operator of order 0. In other words, it's multiplication by a function. So this converts. Uh, uh, a, a one form, a covector, into a function, or if you like, a covector into a value of a function. That's what this symbol is. So this is not uh, terribly important, but just to emphasize the point that this is a, a geometric object defined on the cotangent bundle, let me just uh, give you that formula. Okay. And uh, we're going to be interested, did I write it up here? I guess I didn't. Oh, I did. Elliptic operators. We're going to be interested in elliptic operators. Let me assume that throughout I'll be in this world of self-adjoint operators. Uh, by definition, d, d, d is elliptic if, if this function I just defined is a proper function. It means that the inverse image of each compact set is compact. So it means, so it's a function, where is it? Yeah, function into R. And as, as you travel to infinity in this geometric space, uh, as xi gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so the value of uh, sigma on xi has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. OK, so the, uh, at one extreme, the zero operator is not elliptic, because this function is identically zero. 
doesn't go to infinity at all. All right, uh, very good. And uh, do I want to say this now? Let me think about whether I should, so let me just leave this uh, for a moment, say something else in, in, instead. Of, of course, it's very famous that elliptic operators have many beautiful analytic properties which resemble the properties of, of harmonic functions or, or analytic functions. Let me just uh, summarize maybe by saying they have uh, beautiful uh, regularity properties. This is not a real definition, just, uh, just an idea. So for example, if you try and solve the equation du equal to uh, v, where v is a smooth function, then it's a fact that the only solutions to this equation, even among distributions, are, are also smooth. So these are very particular operators. They have this important regularity property. If you want to solve this equation in smooth functions, the only place to look for solutions is in smooth functions. Okay. Same also for analytic. Okay, and uh, this is very important in index theory. It tells you that the kernel of this operator, the kernel of, a, of a, an elliptic operator has to be finite dimensional. Also, the co-kernel is always finite dimensional, thanks to, thanks to this uh, property here. Okay, one more, one more uh, background, number one, and uh, number two, number three. Which is uh, an effort to connect uh, number one and number two, and so this is work. Again, all of these things very old. This is uh, some important ideas that were worked out by uh, von Neumann. If you want to analyze an, an operator, uh, one of these partial differential operators, if you want to analyze it from the point of view of, of Hilbert space and spectral theory, like, like we see here in, in Hilbert's theorem. So th this differential operator is, is certainly not a compact operator. It's not even a bounded operator. It's not well defined as an operator on, on the Hilbert space uh, L2. And so it's a little complicated to understand how to make a spectral theorem like this for such an operator, but this is what uh, von Neumann worked out. And uh, let, me, let me, in a, in a slightly funny way, uh, tell you what uh, von Neumann worked out. Let me call it, uh, uh, just for this talk, uh, von Neumann symbol, since we have symbols uh, up here. So what, uh, what is this thing? Maybe I'll uh, write it like this. It's, uh, it's a homomorphism of algebras, so a morphism of, in fact, Banach algebras, C star algebras. C star algebra is a type of Banach algebra. Banach algebra is a type of algebra with topology. Anyway, I'll tell you what this is in a moment. And over here, I'm looking at the, the algebra of bounded linear operators on the Hilbert space L2 of N. So th this thing is, is notation that the C star algebraists use. This is the algebra of continuous complex valued. I'm supposed to say valued functions on the space R with one other property, namely they vanish at infinity. As, as, as you go to infinity, the function gets smaller and smaller and smaller. One needs one of these symbols. What is the, the property of this? The property is that if you take these standard so-called resolvent functions, they're mapped by the, uh, this symbol homomorphism to the corresponding resolvent operators. So for an operator to be good for spectral theory, to have a chance to have a spectral theorem, something like this, the operator must have the property that these resolvent operators are well-defined. They have bounded inverses, just like you see. Uh, and once you have these bounded inverses, in fact, they can be combined 
into such a morphism of algebras like this. So the symbol in this case is a slightly funny object. It's a morphism of algebras. Here it's, it's a function. Down here some, some morphism uh, of uh, algebras. And the reason I, I call it a symbol is that uh, we can go back to this thing up here. Going, so supposing that uh, D is uh, a partial differential operator, uh, it has a principal symbol. If D is elliptic, the symbol which I defined here, thanks to the fact that it's a proper function, can, can equally well be, be thought of in the following way. Principal, oops, yeah, that's right. as a morphism of algebras like this, from the functions on R to the functions on the cotangent bundle. Because if I have a function on R, I can just compose it with this version of the symbol that I defined up here. And now it's, now it's a, it's a, a fu function on, on T star of M. And this operation sends functions which vanish at infinity to, to functions which vanish at infinity. Uh, if D is elliptic, uh, thanks to this fact here, thanks to this uh, properness here, the definition. Uh, and I, I, in the case of elliptic operators, thanks to regularity, you can say a little bit more about this von Neumann symbol. Namely, it's a morphism not just from functions on R into bounded operators, but functions into what are called compact operators, exactly these compact operators of, of Hilbert. So now it's an interesting uh, situation. These two symbols, uh, the symbol from partial differential equations and the symbol from operator theory, now they look the same. Almost the same. They're both morphisms uh, of, uh, of uh, C star algebras like this. So, is there more than. Uh, so, superficially, on the surface, these look very similar. On the surface, this looks very similar to this. And so now I ask is there more going on? Is this uh, just a coincidence that they look the same? Is, this, is there more than a superficial? superficial uh, connection, relation between the two, between these things. Of course, the answer is yes, otherwise <laughs> there would be no subject. So I want to uh, spend uh, a lot of time now trying to connect this object, which is the usual symbol that you learn about in partial differential equations, with this object, which is a, a somewhat disguised version of, of these ideas that, uh, that you see from Hilbert's theorem. Maybe I should say one more, one more thing. I wonder if it's possible to uh, maybe I'll just stick it down here. So in the world where D is elliptic, just to emphasize, make, make this funny definition maybe a little less uh, funny. If I take a function here and I convert it into an operator, you can ask, what does this operator do? Well. It's a fact that for elliptic operators, the operator D has one of these orthonormal bases of eigenfunctions, which uh, is up here. And the way this fellow acts on a eigenfunction, it's a little unfortunate. Every function is called F. This Fj is supposed to be a function on the manifold M. And, and this little f is supposed to be a function on the line. I should have used some different letter. But anyway, let me just persevere. This is f of lambda j times f j. So f is in c0 of r.
and the FJs are eigenfunctions for this unbounded operator. Thanks to all of the theory behind me, thanks to the, the, the work of Hilbert, uh, it can be shown that for this operator there is an orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions because in the range of this map there are many compact self-adjoint operators. Thanks to that there is an orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions and this strange symbol that I'm describing is just doing this thing here, not so strange. Okay. So far so good? Any questions? Okay. So I want to describe a beautiful construction of Kahn, of Alain Kahn, which uh, interpolates between this construction and this one, puts these two constructions in a smooth one-parameter family. That's the, the, the main goal. And the, the main technique is, is to observe that this algebra uh, that we see up here can be easily generalized to construct many, many interesting new algebras. Uh, this uh, discussion here resembles very strongly matrix algebras, but we can easily change this to get much more complicated algebras than matrix algebras. Maybe I should say new. So first of all, just to, 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 to place uh, everything in context, as for old, I just mean the fact that if I have a continuous function on, on m uh, times n, two continuous functions, then uh, then on this space of functions, there is a convolution multiplication, namely the one which, which you see up here. So this space of functions, this linear space of continuous functions on m times m, it's an algebra. And now I will show you lots of new algebras by just by giving uh, examples. So suppose I have, uh, for, for simplicity, a, a Lie group. And, and suppose it acts smoothly on some closed manifold M, like we were uh, discussing. And so there's an action uh, map like that. This, this action map tells you everything about the action, of course. And so does this space here. Let me call it G semi-direct product M. As you'll see, it's really a, just a disguised version of, of, of G times M. I, just want, I want to look at all triples like this. And I put in x, but it's, it's not really there. x is just g times y. So x is determined by, by, by g and y. I, I didn't need to, need to put it in. So this, uh, of course, this space is isomorphic to just g times m that we started with. But when I write uh, the space g times m in this way, now it resembles a little bit m times m. The only difference is that in the middle there is a G. It's not M times M, it's M times G times M. But we can repeat uh, what we were doing before in this new context. Let me introduce some obvious, obviously useful notation. Let's suppose I have two pairs of points in this space, X, Y, and Y, Z. If it happens to be the case that uh, this element here is equal to this element here, as you see in this uh, formula, let me just define this composition to be x, z, like that. If I define that, uh, make this funny choice of notation, then I can simplify a little bit the definition of the multiplication of two kernels, which you still see up there. Namely, you, you could uh, write it this way. You just integrate over all possible ways of factorizing gamma as gamma 1 times gamma 2, k1 of gamma 1 k2 
gamma 2. And maybe it's worth to note, what is this integral? Well, it's this. If you look at the set of all pairs, gamma 1, gamma 2, such that gamma 1 is composable with gamma 2, and the result gives gamma. So if gamma is given, if x and z is given, the only way you can make, make a pair which is composable to this is to vary y in this way. So this funny space is just a disguised copy of m. And so when I'm doing this integration here, in effect, I'm just integrating over m. All right, now here's another uh, construction. Maybe down here, I'll define a composition in this way. Uh, lots of, let me call it x1, g1, x2. X3, I guess, is logical. What's a reasonable composition here? Well, this is a reasonable composition. This uh, triple satisfies uh, this law, assuming the other two triples do. So it's a new, a new composition law. And, and so I can uh, define in this context the composition law exactly as I did before, namely k1 of gamma 1, k2 of gamma 2. And maybe I'll stick it down here. If I look at the set of all factorizations, for a fixed gamma, if I look at the set of all factorizations, as you, as you see in this integral, or as you see here, maybe I should say here, this is for gamma fixed. Uh, this is now, well, it's no longer a copy of M, but it's a copy of G, and, and G is a Lie group, so we know how to integrate on a Lie group. There is how measure. And so when I write this integral here, uh, I mean that we use how measure. Okay, and now I've built a new algebra. I look at all uh, functions. Maybe I should be a little careful here to make sure the integral uh, converges, maybe I should deal with compactly supported functions on this space. I define convolution in this way, it's well defined, and I get a new interesting convolution algebra in this way. If you're a specialist, then, then the, the right thing to do, it's some small detail. The right thing to do is to complete this algebra into a Banach algebra. And I'll, I'll write the result as something like this. The C star algebra of G, semi-direct product M, like that. So, so just for comparison, if I were to do this for the space, which was m times m, uh, as at the very top, this would be this C star algebra of classical C star algebra of compact operators, as in the work of Hilbert. But now, all of a sudden, there's a uh, huge variety of algebras to study and, and possibly apply to, to, to different problems. And uh, of course, I, what I want to do is take this uh, concept and, and return to elliptic operators. But, but first, let's just look at a fun uh, example. So let uh, the manifold be the circle. And consider the group, act, the group of integers acting on a circle by rotation through some, some angle here of uh, theta. So the group, uh, I'll just choose to be this discrete group of integers. It's, it, it's, a, it's a Lie group. And, and, and the way the group is acting on the circle is that the, the integer one is acting by rotation by the angle theta. And it gets the most interesting when, when theta is an irrational multiple, multiple 
of one entire uh, revolution. And so there's, uh, there's an algebra here. which you build in this way, in which you might be relevant. It might be relevant to the dynamics of, of, of this action. It, it's a, a famous C star algebra that people have studied for many reasons. It's called A theta, so-called irrational rotation algebra. It's a, one of these C star algebras. And just to show you one thing to tell you how, how interesting this is, let me, let me make one remark about the, the structure of uh, idempotence in this algebra. It's very, very interesting. First of all, to go back to the, the algebra studied by, by Hilbert, the, the Seaster algebra of uh, compact operators, Idempotence in here, I mean elements of the algebra E, such that E squared is equal to E. Usual elements in the sense of idempotence in the sense of algebra. So these are operators on a Hilbert space, which are idempotent operators. E squared is equal to E. And they are compact operators. It means not very big, given by kernels. Uh, there are, uh, all of these things are classified by their rank. Any two idempotents with the same rank are essentially uh, the same. Uh, and the rank, of course, it's a positive number and it's integral, uh, like that. On the other hand, if you replace the study now, this new convolution, uh, I mean, uh, why not? There's also a rank uh, in this context. You can see from the result I'm about to write down that this rank is much more strange than the rank uh, up here because the rank takes values which are not just uh, integral, but they're also integral multiples of, of theta, like that. And so it's very strange and interesting what goes on. And uh, this, this, this algebra of integral kernels, it somehow remembers the amount of the angle of rotation. In a very strange way, it remembers the angle of rotation. Uh, this result can be captured or, or recaptured, can be understood using K-theory, especially the K-theory invented, the version of K-theory invented by Professor Kasparov. So it's very beautiful and interesting. The first example uh, that you might study already is very deep and, and, and interesting. But we're going to look at, uh, go back to, to this world of, um, we're going to go back to this world of elliptic operators here, try to solve uh, this problem here. Uh, and we shall solve it following Kahn using, using this construction from, from the left. And so now I'm going to build a, a family of convolution operators. Here we studied just one individual one. Here's, uh, now we study a family, which is kind of interesting. And the parameter I'll call S, and S will be a, a real number. So we build a, a family of, of constructions exactly like this business here. And in each member of the family, the group will be Rn. And in each member of the family, the, the manifold also will be Rn, so it's not compact for a moment, but okay. Uh, and now it, the only thing which distinguishes the, the families is, is, is the action. So the question is, how does a group element act on a, on a manifold element? And there's going to be one action for each number s. Maybe I indicate the action like that with a 
subscript. Uh, so this is defined to be x plus, and now we just rescale usual addition, s times g. It makes sense because uh, x and g are both vectors in Rn, and so you can form any linear combination. Okay. It's just a, a linear combination in a vector space. And it's interesting to study uh, the results. So I'm interested in the C star algebra of G, semi direct product. Now I have to put in S somewhere so we remember. Maybe I'll put it down there. Um, so I'm taking functions on G times M, let's say continuous compactly supported functions on G times M. I'm defining a convolution multiplication like this. And then, just as a matter of technicality, I, I, I form the, some completion, some closure. It, so, somehow, n no big deal. Basically, I form this convolution algebra, exactly this one here. And it's very interesting uh, uh, what happens. There's a dichotomy between what happens when s is not zero and, and, and when s is zero. If s is not zero, where are we here? If S is not zero, if we examine this space for a moment, this one up here, I said that in this space, X is determined by G and Y. But if S is not zero, G is determined by X and Y. Because if S is not zero, you can compute G from X plus S times G and X. Right? So G is 1 over S. Uh, y minus x. I, I, I'm using this notation here. A triple in this space has the property that x and y and g are related, and, and the formula for the relation is what I wrote down there. So, so what happens is that uh, in this particular example, when s is not 0, you can forget about g. You can forget about g. It's not actually it's not actually there. You can determine G by two copies of M. Uh, and so uh, what you get is just the compact operators. You're in the world of, of Hilbert. On the other hand, suppose S is zero. If S is zero, there, there's no action at all. It's actually just a, a trivial action. And uh, if you think about that, this, this convolution multiplication is, is just a combination of two things. The convolution multiplication, as far as the variable x is concerned, is just pointwise multiplication. But as far as the group element is concerned, it's ordinary convolution of functions on Rn, like you learn about in harmonic analysis. And, and so, maybe I'll put an isomorphism there. I'm going to write it like this. What I'm going to do here is take Fourier transform from G times M. I'm only going to take Fourier transform in, in the variable G. And let me call the, I don't know, the dual of G. Maybe I should just call it G hat like that. From this guy to this guy. And now I'm just also making a, the obvious identification, identification of G times M. Remember that G in this case is Rn, so it's Rn times Rn. That's a copy of the tangent bundle, like that. So when I vary these group actions, uh, I obtain a family of, of algebras, a family of convolution multiplications, and it, most of the convolution multiplications are just these compact operators. So this is just Hilbert's compact operators on L2M. Uh, but in, in one special case, it, there's one special value, and, and there you get the functions on the cotangent bundle. And there's a, a wonderful small miracle
So we have here some type of continuous family. In, in, in C star algebras, it's called a continuous field. So I want to think of these spaces together with uh, multiplications. It's invariant, so although we built it using uh, lots of linear algebra, so we, lots of linear combinations were, were used to build this family of algebras. Actually, once you've built them, they don't depend on linear algebra. They only depend on the underlying manifold. So this whole thing is invariant under the group of diffeomorphisms. So although we, we defined it using uh, manifold structure, uh, excuse me, using vector space structure, it only depends on the underlying C infinity manifold structure. And the really marvelous theorem, it's not difficult. Uh, due to Kahn is, is, is the following following fact that if you look at the morphisms of algebras from C0 of R into these C star algebras that we've built. Now I'm going to, well, first maybe I keep this notation. In, in, nobody actually writes this. They, they use some other notation here. They talk about the fiber of the, what's called the tangent groupoid. write it like that. The, the morphisms that you get in, in the following way on the one hand we could take this von Neumann symbol from before of a rescaled version of D, namely I'll just multiply D by S to the Q. Q is the order of D. That's when S is not zero. And here we'll just take the usual classical or principal symbol. Bananas is zero. Uh, these things here, oh, here we go. <laughs> exactly, these things here, maybe I'll try and squeeze it down here. Um, form a continuous section or a morphism continuous family, I guess, continuous family, are a continuous family of morphisms compatible with continuous variation. And so there's this really re remarkable and unexpected way of smoothly, uh, if you like, degenerating Hilbert's algebra of compact operators here we go, Hilbert's algebra of compact operators, which is of course highly non-commutative. It's inspired by matrices. It's uh, uh, non-commutative, simple algebra. Somehow it gets deformed into this uh, algebra of functions, of course, far from simple and, and far from non-commutative, also very commutative. Okay. And what are we doing? The way to think about this is that it links, this theorem links together two things. One is the, the, the classical symbol, which is easy to calculate in, in local coordinates. You can simply write down the principal symbol of any operator. If I give it to you explicitly, for example, I give you the Laplacian, then you can write down what is the principal symbol in a very explicit way. And so the principal symbol here is very, very computable. This von Neumann symbol is not computable at all. No longer there. The reason it's not com computable is that it, inv it involves all of the eigenfunctions of the operator. To, to calculate what is the von Neumann symbol, you have to take the operator d and you have to solve the, the eigenvalue problem, df is equal to lambda f, completely. So you have a complete basis of uh, eigenfunctions. And so it's very, very difficult to understand what uh, is going on here when, when s is, is not zero. It's very, very complicated 
to understand what's going on. When s is zero, it, it's very easy to understand what's going on, and yet they vary continuously one to, to, to another. And uh, one famous application, which is a very old theorem, it goes back to the, the, the beginning, the, the time when Hilbert proved his theorem. But it's, uh, it's really the first thing you can extract from this type of, of mathematics is, is Weyl's law for the asymptotics of the eigenvalues lambda j of an operator d. And what it says is that these eigenvalues behave like this, roughly speaking, some constant times uh, j to some power, which is something like q divided by the dimension. So this numerical fact ab about uh, the asymptotic behavior of eigenvalues follows just very naturally from this, this, this general uh, fact here. And uh, I, I don't have time to say more than a, a very little bit about this, but uh, I think it's clear from, from uh, what you see here from our discussion of symbols and so on that uh, something like the following should be true. If you have an elliptic operator D, it has a, a symbol that we were just discussing. I'm talking about the principal symbol, the one that you can calculate. And uh, one of the great... Uh, insights of a tier and singer is that the symbol of an elliptic operator defines an element in k-theory like this. So it, as when a tier and singer proved the index theorem, the, the, their fundamental insight was that k-theory played an important role. And uh, in particular, the symbol, the principal symbol of an operator defines a class. Uh, a class within the realm of cohomology theory, within the realm of k-theory, some homotopical invariant of an operator. On the other hand, there is this von Neumann symbol, and it defines a class in the k-theory of Hilbert's algebra of compact operators, like that. Oh, it's some complicated thing. I have a C star algebra, not a space, and, and now I took some k-theory of it. It doesn't matter what this is. The only thing you need to know about this abelian group, so this is some cohomology group, and so is this, but this one is just equal to z. It's not hard to, to calculate this thing here. And what you get here is the, the famous analytic index, the analytic or Fredholm index of d. So one construction somehow smoothly, uh, continuously at least, interpolates between the analytical index that you see in the famous Atiyah-Singer index theorem and the topological index. They both live in the same world. It's not a proof of the index theorem, but it's very encouraging that you are working towards the proof of the index theorem just by making this construction. So I can't say any more about that. And, and let me just close by hinting at some other more recent developments using the same technology. One more piece. The first is some, a piece of work I admire uh, a great deal. And it has to do with index theory, n not on smooth manifolds, but on, on so-called contact manifolds. Well, they are example, particular cases of smooth manifolds. Smooth manifolds with extra structure. So a contact manifold is this, like an odd dimensional symplectic manifold. And what I like about this is that the correct formulation of the index theorem. So there is an index theorem like the theorem of Atiyah and Singer for such manifolds. They're all odd dimensional. In, in, in the world of Atiyah and Singer, 
there is no index theory on an odd dimensional manifold, at least for differential operators, but, but, but here it's uh, quite different. Now, the, the thing about contact manifolds, an ordinary manifold is locally diffeomorphic to Rn. That's the definition of a manifold. A contact manifold is something which is locally diffeomorphic not to Rn, but to the, the group of uh, um, nilpotent uh, matrices of the following uh, sort, like this. And so uh, what do I want to do? I want to put an x1 here and a y1 here and an x2 here and a y2 here, da, da, da. I've run out of room. <laughs> and zero is everywhere else. So in this particular case, I drew the example where n is equal to 2. So this is a, a group of matrices. It's not an abelian group. It's very close to being an abelian group. It's a step two nilpotent group. But it's not an uh, abelian group. And the construction that I outlined here gives rise to a symbol class which lies in a very uh, funny place, namely in the K-theory of what you might call the C-star algebra of the bundle of Heisenberg tangent spaces of M. And this thing here is a bundle of nilpotent groups. The tangent bundle is a bundle of, of a usual manifold, is a bundle of vector spaces. And each vector space, each tangent space, is the best approximation to the manifold at any given point. So in this world, the best approximation is not, is not, a, is not a vector space, it's a, it's a nilpotent group. And, and so using uh, the language of Alain Kahn, it's easy to understand where the symbol class should lie, the symbol class of a tier and singer. And it's not in the world of ordinary topology. It's in this strange world of non-commutative K-theory. And uh, you would not, uh, you would not uh, discover that. You would not even know how to formulate the index theorem. Indeed, uh, this is exactly what happened. People struggled for 10 years to, to formulate the index theorem. They failed even to formulate it because they did not know where the ingredients uh, should lie. But they follow very naturally out of this development here. I'm not going to spend time on the other thing except to just write it down, developments related to Bismuth's work on the hypoelliptical plasma, hypoelliptic. Okay, it's uh, time for me to stop, so th thank you very much. <laughs>